Welcome to part two of this series looking at the dress of Western Europe over the centuries. In the first part, which you may wish to go back to if you haven't already seen it, we covered the 12th to the 17th centuries, and in this part we'll begin by looking at the 18th century. Due to certain pesky copyright laws, I can't really go past 1900 in this video, but if you have any questions about the first couple of decades of the 20th century, then I will do my very best to answer them in the Q&A that I'll be doing on this channel at the beginning of May. By this century, men's clothes have taken on a very familiar theme that men's suits still hold to today. The coats and waistcoats that Charles II brought back from the French court roughly 40 years before the beginning of this century were the forerunner to the modern suit, and the 18th century further refined that. Coats, waistcoats, breeches, shirts, stockings, these words don't really need defining, and so we'll be focusing on the far more unusual and specific terms that came with this era. Neckcloth. Let's begin with the humble neckcloth, a long strip of linen wrapped several times around the throat and tied in the front in different styles of decorative knot. Stock. A stock is a pleated band of linen attached to a non-pleated backing and worn around the neck as an alternative to a neckcloth. Tricorn hat. Perhaps the most famous style of hat associated with this era. A hat with a rounded crown and the brim folded up on three sides until the hat forms a triangle, nowadays very much associated with pirates, but they were worn by men of every class and profession. Bicorn hat. The same idea as a tricorn but with two corners, very much associated with the navy and the military. Banyan. A dressing gown or house coat inspired by garments from India and the East, often made from fabrics imported from such places. In this era, women's wear is far less familiar to us than men's, and thanks to extensive records and extant garments, we have a good understanding of the specific names for these pieces. Much of the first two decades of this century, the mantua that I mentioned in my last video was still popular, and left a legacy behind it in that dressmakers from this point on were known as mantua makers, even when they weren't making mantuas anymore. Women wore gowns, jackets and petticoats in multitudes of combinations. We'll be going through some of the names for the most famous styles in this video, but first I should provide some context for the everyday items worn either beneath them or with them. Chemise or shift. In this era, as in all the eras before it, the first layer a woman put on was a chemise or a shift. As in previous eras, no underwear was worn on the lower half or legs. That was to come later. Petticoat. Both the name for what we think of as petticoats, simple layers to help hold out the skirt, and the name for the outer skirts themselves in this era. Pannier, or panniers, large lightweight skirt supports extending to either side in a vaguely oval shape. Smaller sets referred to as pocket hoops can also be found. False rump, or bum roll. Worn since the 1500s, a padded roll of fabric to support the skirts. In this era, they grew in size as the century progressed until they resembled large, shaped pillows sitting over the hips and backside. Whilst this is an exaggerated cartoon, this does provide a good idea of what they looked like. Pockets. Pockets in this era were separate from the garments they were used with. Pockets were worn under the skirts, tied around the waist, and were accessible through slits in the gown, petticoats, and if necessary, panniers. Stays. Much the same as they were in the 17th century, stays were a conical cone-shaped support garment meant to provide bust and back support, create the fashionable silhouette and a smooth base for clothes to sit over. Stomacher. A decorative section of stiffened fabric providing a focal point at the front of a gown, bearing applied decoration in the form of lace, trim, bows and embroidery, usually pinned to the stays beneath the gown, with the gown then secured to the stomacher with further pins. Fichu, neckerchief or kerchief. Filling the same role as the partlet from previous centuries, the fichu was a roughly square or rectangular piece of fabric, often a very lightweight linen or cotton, that was tucked into the neckline of a gown or worn crossed over the body and tied behind the waist. Often they were decorated with white work embroidery. Mantua. The gown from which all 18th century gowns evolved. It changed very little from the 17th century, only perhaps gaining fuller skirts. Robe à l'anglaise, or English nightgown. Not an actual nightgown, this dress was one of the more popular styles of the century. The legacy of the mantua can be seen in the pleats on the back of this gown as they transition into the skirts, cut as one piece. By the 1780s this was no longer the case, and the bodices and skirts were cut separately. This style of dress stuck around for pretty much the entire century with only small changes. It began with robings down the front and a stomacher, and gradually transformed into a sleeker gown that closed at the centre front, often with pins. <laughs> 
The sleeves were usually three-quarter length and stopped at the elbow. Early iterations of this gown have what are called engageants, white lace or white fabric ruffles, which can be lightly stitched into the ends of the sleeves, although these begin to vanish later on and are replaced with smaller ruffles if they are replaced at all. This gown was worn with both panniers and false rumps, providing a wide range of skirt shapes. Robe à la Française Perhaps the most famous dress from this era, also called a sac or a sac back gown, has large pleats falling from the shoulders which are cut as one with the skirts. The gown is fitted to the body by way of the lining and the pleats hang away from the body down the back. The size of the panniers worn beneath these gowns varies hugely. These gowns nearly always have a stomacher at the front and are usually rather lavishly trimmed. Robe à la Polonaise the polonaise, which was named for the partition of Poland in 1772, is an open robe with the bodice and skirts cut as one. They sweep back from what is usually a false waistcoat-like bodice at the front and descend diagonally backwards into the skirts, which are usually pulled up in three separate swags with cords or drawstrings. This style of gathering up the skirt is referred to as retoussé in contemporary sources and was often done with gowns that are not actually polonaise gowns as well. This has led to any gown with this style of swagging being called a polonaise. Thanks, Victorians. However, this is inaccurate. Robe de cour. An extremely structured and elaborate gown, the robe de cour or court gown was worn at official court functions in most European countries. The only 18th century gown to actually lace up at the back, these gowns often had lower, wider necklines, more fitted bodices, wider panniers and were overall more lavishly and expensively trimmed than any other gowns a person would own. Robe volante. From the back, these look similar to a robe à la française, but from the front, this style is far looser and more relaxed looking. Reminiscent of a dressing gown or a robe, but not worn as such, this style was not popular in England and was viewed as rather too relaxed. It hangs loose from the shoulders and flares over the waist. We often see it associated with pregnancy. Riding habit. A costume worn for riding or travelling, reminiscent of menswear from the period and usually constructed by a tailor instead of a mantua maker. Reading goat. A more fashion oriented version of the riding habit, not intended for riding, again inspired by menswear of the period. Caraco, Casaquin, Pet en l'air, Piero. There are many different styles of jacket which were worn as bodices in this period, and what makes each jacket a Casaquin as opposed to a Pet en l'air or a Caraco tends to change depending on who you ask and when. There is some belief that this sack back style jacket was known as a cassequin until the 1740s before the name changed to a pet en l'air. The caraco tends to have a fitted back, although the skirts vary in length, and Piero jackets tend to have very short tails concentrated in the back. Chemise à la reine. Translating to chemise of the queen, these gowns have a divisive history and are very important to the progression of women's fashion from this point on, so we'll be talking about them in a bit more detail. Also called a robe en chemise, or a chemise en gole, this gown was famously popularised by Marie Antoinette, who wanted something more comfortable to wear at her private retreat, La Petite Trianon, and chose to have her portrait painted by Elizabeth Louise Vigilebrun whilst wearing one. It was seen as highly risque because of its resemblance to underwear, and when the portrait, which I can't show here unfortunately, was displayed at the Paris Salon, there was a huge outcry. It was quickly removed, and Vigile Brun replaced it with a far more socially acceptable portrait of the Queen in a blue silk satin robe à anglaise. These gowns have none of the structure associated with dresses of this era. They're very soft and light, and more or less comprised of lots of gathered fabric. They were made from the lightest, finest linens or muslins, which were not like our modern-day muslin, and were practically sheer, the gathers really the only thing disguising their translucency. They were not always worn with stays beneath them either, and because the fabric was imported, they were also seen as unpatriotic, since they undermined the French silk industry. This style of gown, whilst initially hated, became highly popular, and by the 1790s, its symbolism had shifted to representing the purity of the revolutionary cause. They were worn by women of many different classes and political leanings, and they are the forerunner of the white neoclassical empire line gowns we associate with the Regency period. Open robe, an overgown that gained popularity in the 1790s. These robes were made to be worn over the simple white chemise-style gowns to dress them up a little. Often made from silk or patterned cottons, these robes were very open in the front with the skirts concentrated at the back. The Regency era technically spans 1811 to 1820, the period during which George IV ruled as Prince Regent for his ailing father, George III. However, we tend to rather more broadly apply it to the years between 1800 to 1830. It brought with it a taste for elegant simplicity and neoclassical styles in art, architecture and fashion. It was during this period that fashionable men began to wear trousers and breeches became reserved for evening wear and the royal court. 
Women's wear takes on simple lines at the beginning of the 1800s, but grows fussier and more elaborate as the period progresses. Again, men's wear follows some very familiar themes, so we won't be discussing waistcoats or shirts here. Pantaloons and trousers. In France, the revolution had already had people moving away from breeches. The revolutionary sans-culottes, literally without breeches, so-called because they wore what we would see as trousers, had forcefully encouraged this move towards longer trousers. Here we would have called these wide-legged, ankle-length trousers slops, and they were originally worn by sailors and working men. The close-fitting trousers or pantaloons that Beau Brummel would make fashionable in the 1810s were a different beast entirely. Sculpted around the contours of the leg and incredibly tight, these trousers became a source of ridicule in many a cartoon before they were fully adopted by men in general. Garrick coats or great coats. Cloaks were still worn, however they were gradually being replaced by garrick or carrick coats, also known as great coats. These heavy coats with layers of capes draping over the shoulders began life as coachmen's uniforms before being adopted by men of all classes. Featured here is a cartoon depicting a beadle. I was rather limited in my resources for showing you this style of coat, however this does at least give an idea. Stays. During this period, we do begin to see the word corset come into use, but largely women's support garments are still called stays in this era. However, they're soft, barely boned at all, and instead structured by way of quilting, cording and decorative stitching. With a central busk, they're more about soft curves at this point, not reducing the waist at all. They aim to support and separate the bust. Bodiced petticoats. With the advent of the Empire Line waist, bodiced petticoats become necessary to hold them at the right height. Chemisette. Similar to the partlet of earlier centuries, the chemisette replaced the fichu for filling in the neckline of gowns. As I mentioned in my last video, these gowns evolved from the robe en chemise, popular in the 1780s and 90s. Originally, the fullness of the skirts was fairly even all around the waist, however, the most significant change they underwent early on was for this volume to shift to the back and for these gowns to become more sleek and minimalistic. Gowns thus began the century heavily inspired by simplistic Greco-Roman styles. They gradually changed over the years until they became more elaborate, and some may say fussier, their skirts filling out to eventually reach the bell shape of the 1830s. Pelisse, an ankle-length, high-waisted coat. Spencer, a short jacket ending under the bust or in line with the waistline of the gown. Reticule, a small decorative handbag. For fashionable women who adopted the sleek neoclassical styles, it replaced the pockets of the previous century that could no longer be hidden beneath the thinner dresses. The Victorian era, marked by styles that change and shift every decade. In this era, we won't examine men's clothes at all. The names we use for them haven't changed between then and today, and they're all familiar enough anyway. Women's wear underwent so many changes that it would be impossible to focus on any of them in any depth, but I will do my very best to highlight as many as I can and supply you with some useful terms. Corsets. In this era, corsets change. The focus is back on the waist for the first time in decades, and new technologies mean you can achieve more dramatic shapes. Whilst there is often relatively little waist reduction with the help of padding and optical illusions provided by large sleeves and large skirts, women's waists are shown off to their best advantage. The aim of the corset is still primarily to provide bust and back support and to smooth out the figure. Corded petticoats. For much of the 1830s and 40s, before the invention of the crinoline, the skirts of a dress were supported by many petticoats, some of which would have been corded. This was done by running bands of cord around the petticoat to stiffen it. Drawers. The 1820s brought with them drawers. Until this point, women had worn nothing beneath their chemises. By the 1830s, most women were wearing split drawers beneath their skirts. These were two separate legs connected only at the waist, without the crotch seam sewn up to allow easy trips to the bathroom. Combinations. Women continued to wear their chemises with their drawers for quite some time before a garment that combined the two was created. This is where combinations come in. A sleeveless vest-like top half attached to split drawers, this one-piece garment cut down on fuss and bulk at the waist and simplified dressing. Corset cover. A vest-like garment worn over the corset to smooth out its lines and stop them showing through the bodice. Dresses. 
It's important to note in general that for much of this century, in large part, dresses were formed of at least two pieces, a bodice and a skirt. There are exceptions, such as the tea gown and simple work dresses, but on the whole they were separate. There is a vast array of styles of gown in this century, so vast that I honestly don't have the time to get into them, much as I wish I did. For the upper classes, the etiquette associated with changing your clothes based on the time of day and the activity you were doing reached its peak. You had dresses appropriate for the morning, for walking, doing sports, for entertaining in the afternoon, for dinner, for evening and for balls and parties. At the beginning of this period, we saw a contained bell-like silhouette which broadened into the flared crinoline before tapering down to the bustle. The bustle gown itself changed in size several times before settling into the more tame fluted shape of the 1890s. Shirt waists. The 1880s brought with them more masculine fashions for women, and whilst shirts had been a part of women's dress since the 1860s, they became hugely popular in the 90s and early 1900s. Crinolines. The infamous cage crinolines of the 1860s were invented shortly before the decade began and were primarily constructed from wire or flat steel circles suspended on tapes and hanging from the waist. These kept the skirts away from the legs and allowed skirt proportions to balloon out to incredible sizes. Bustle cages. The crinoline gradually transitioned into the bustle cage, the rather even bell shape first beginning to move only slightly towards the back with the elliptical crinoline in the late 60s, and then eventually focusing almost solely on the back with the bustle of the 70s and 80s. These changed in style and shape, taking a break for a while with the natural form era in the 1870s, before coming back with a vengeance in the 1880s. Made similarly to crinolines, these light wire or steel frame cages would support the weight of both the skirts and the fashionable apron over skirts. Bustle pads this is a slightly unusual example, but the most common forms were padded shapes, much like the kind used to support skirts in the 18th century. At first, these pads were worn underneath crinolines and bustles to help support them at the back and to keep them off the hips. In the 1890s, bustle cages were replaced by smaller bustle pads. Well, there you have it. Not a comprehensive list to be sure. If I were to share that with you, we would have been here for hours, but it's a start. Dress history is a vast and complex subject, and I have barely scratched the surface sitting here giving names to as many things as I can with the time that's been given to me. If you weren't already interested in dress history before, and you've made it this far, I sincerely hope that you are now. If you have any further questions, I can be found on Instagram and TikTok at Woodsmoke and Words, on Twitter at Woodsmoke Words, and I'll also be doing a Q&A right here on this channel at the beginning of May. Thank you for watching.